Another revision video for an inspector calls for the AQA, well for the GCSE English Literature and this one's going to look at the style and technique of the play. Right, back to the central message of the play, You've probably seen the other videos, you will know what I think, it's a morality play promoting a need for social responsibility. It's important that I start all of the videos with that just to, to show, you know, this is, uh, this is our, our foundation and all of our analysis is kind of link back to this uh, this statement that it is a play that is trying to instruct uh, good morals with respect to uh, our responsibility within society. First of all, the uh, in terms of technique, the genre of the play it's very similar to a Who Done It. Now, if you don't know what a Who Done It is, if you, you know, when you think of the Agatha Christie novels. Uh, uh, Miss Marple, um, Hercule Poirot, this, uh, this kind of thing where it takes place in, uh, um, they're, they're normally set in the same place, a, a mansion of some kind, they've got a wealth of different characters, uh, there's a murder takes place and the inspector or, or the, the sleuth of some kind has to, to work out who has committed the murder uh, and there's always a range of possible suspects and a few red herrings. Uh, so this and this was a very popular genre at the time of the play, it came out in 1946, and this play is very similar in terms of those conventions. It is, however, it's not really a, um, a whodunit, is it? Because there's no murder takes place, it's a suicide, um, and so there's no criminal as such to, to work out. But this is a morality play, and, and as I've said, it's there to provide moral instruction. Now, morality plays, they there's the kind of a type of play that was popular in the medieval uh, times, and they would often contain characters that uh, personified particular moral attitudes. So characters had a kind of allegorical uh, role, and they were personifying a particular moral attitude. And as we see, the inspector, um, arguably, so people might disagree with me here, but um, I'm, I'm pretty, well, I'm pretty confident that uh, in, in my argument, obviously, uh, I, I believe that the inspector personifies the idea of social conscience, that thinking of thinking for others. Now, in terms of the structure of the play, it's called a, a well-made play, and, and this is not us saying, "Oh, yeah, well done, Priestley. You've, you know, that that play in Inspector Falls it was really well made." No, well-made play is a, 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 is actually a type of play, and well-made plays they often have a tight plot. Um, there will be a climax close to the end and most of the action occurs before the start of the play and we see that actually that, that's the case with an inspectacles type plot, it's just got one plot um, over a couple of hours in time. Uh, the climax, uh, arguably the climax is, is at the end with the, the revelation of Eric um, and the action involving Eva Smith has occurred before the play has, be uh, has begun. It applies the three dramatic unities. So if we go back to um, classical uh, plays, classical drama, the, the ancient Greeks, they would have their uh, plays that would be united through these three. The unity of place, in other words, the action all takes place in one setting, the living room uh, of, the, the, of the Burlings. So there's, there's no other settings other than that. There's the unity of action. There's just one plot. There are no subplots. The the kind of the descriptions of what happened with Eva Smith. They're they're not subplots. They're part of the main plot. So we don't have any subplots involving any other characters or anything like that. And there's the unity of time. It takes place in real time. The length of the play is the length of the the, the time that passes. Um, in the world of the play. So the inspector goes round, he's there for about two hours interviewing all of the characters and then he goes curtain falls. Now because of this, because of these um, three units, it really, we become voyeurs, in other words we are observers. Now all, audio, uh, you know, all members of an audience, no matter what play it is, are an observer, but it, it, it kind of feels like we're invading in someone's uh, room and we're, we're, seeing this, uh, we're seeing this all play out, which increases the tension. Now imagine yourself in class and uh, a teacher is uh, telling off a, a student and the student argues back 
and that becomes a very tense moment and it becomes tense for you because you are watching it and you, you, you wonder what's happening. We as an audience at Inspector Calls, we are watching their, their lives unravel before them and we feel like we're, we, you know, it's almost like Big Brother that we're, uh, that we're these, these voyeurs, these voyeuristically uh, watching for our entertainment. Now the language of the play. We see that the, Mr. Burling's provincial dialect, in other words, he has an accent um, and he uses words that uh, betray his social origins. Okay, We've said in the character video that he comes from a working class background and his speech shows that. Look at the use of personal pronouns in the play. Burling uses a lot of I, me and myself, singular personal pronouns. Whereas the inspector uses some plural uh, personal pronouns. We, us and our. We are members of one body, he says uh, towards the end. Whereas Burling says um, a man has to look, out, look out for himself. You know, he, he deals with the singular. And this is used to show the different ideologies. We have Burling's uh, individualism and capitalist um, attitudes and, and uh, values and the inspector representing uh, more social um, socialist uh, values. We also see, as I've said in one of my other videos on themes, repetition of the words responsible and responsibility, really hammering home that uh, that central theme. And also the, the language is quite clear and direct. This is quite a realistic play. Even you know, we put aside the the inspector being this ghost or, or, or kind of angel figure, we'll put that to one side. The language is quite clear and direct, um, adding to those three unities, this idea that it it actually is quite realistic. Now, another technique, dramatic irony. This in essence, is when the audience know more than the characters. Not the actors, of course the actors know more than us because uh, they've got to act out the play, but more than the characters. So we we have a, a kind of an elevated position in terms of knowledge. Very easy to do this when you perf first perform a play in 1946, but you set it in 1912 and the play mentions the Titanic, it mentions uh, uh, it, the, it implies the general strike, the Russian Revolution and of course the two world wars that took place in between those two years. Um, now because we know that, our hindsight it increases the tension through a sense of fate and inevitability. In other words, we know that something is going to go wrong. Uh, the film Titanic in 1997, uh, we had uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and, and uh, Kate Winslet falling in love on, on this ship and they, every time they keep talking about how they're going to be happy in America. Well, we know, because we know that the ship is going to sink, that um, that's not going to happen and it increases the tension. The dramatic irony, it also allows Priestley to foreshadow the fate of the Burling. So when Mr. Burling is saying there's no chance of uh, war, Titanic, unsinkable, there'll be no labour troubles, we get a sense that he's wrong about that, or well, we know that he's wrong about that, and therefore we get a sense that his his knighthood and their celebration, the, the, the posterity that he kind of uh, is predicting is not going to happen which leads us on to tension. Because of that dramatic irony in Mr. Burling's speech, we have that kind of sense of foreboding that something wrong is going to happen, something bad is going to happen. Then we have Mrs. Burling towards the end, in act, yeah, at the end of Act 2, where she's saying that the father as child is most responsible. We know that she is judging her own son, and we know she's essentially condemning him. The revelations, they're made in a sequential order. In other words, it's a sequence. We don't find out everything all at the same time. That draws it out, that uh, ekes out the information. It withholds the information. And therefore, uh, we as an audience, we uh, it draws out our anticipation. Because of the three act structure that you might not see um, if you go and see the play these days, it will probably have a... Um, one interval right in the middle, but the, it's written in three acts which allows for cliffhangers. The curtain falls at the end of Act 1, 
2 and 3. And particularly in Act 1 and 2, I want you to think of that curtain fall as the, the kind of drum beats at the end of EastEnders. It will always happen at a high moment, a tense moment. In other words, wanting the audience to want to watch it again. There's a lack of resolution at the end. In other words, the inspector is gone, they think it's a fake, and then they find out that um, there, there is actually a girl who has committed suicide, completely the same circumstances, that an inspector is coming around, and the, and the tension and the curtain falls. This restores that tension. So at first there was this relief, but then we end on another high moment. 